These are only 90 minutes long. I do want to keep to time in honor of all of your time. And we have a ton to cover. Uh, we may not may not get through everything tonight. Um, this is a public meeting. If there were members of the public here, uh, which in this case would include David Delcor and Orca Media, um, and anybody wants to raise a virtual hand or a real hand, I'm scanning and we'll take public comment. I don't see any public comments, so I'm going to keep moving. Um, if you have opened the agenda that I sent via email, that's great. If not, don't worry about it. I'll just read through and uh, tell you what we're doing next. Um, the next step is a consent agenda. This is following a pattern that is used by the school board, among others. And that is in future meetings, if we all feel as though we agree with whatever minutes I have taken and distributed, we can simply say we approve the consent agenda and then move on. From there, because this is our first meeting, we do not have minutes from the previous meeting. Uh, the next 20 minutes or so, I'd like to spend with introductions and getting to know one another a little bit. Uh, again, this is going to be, we're going to be in constant tension in this group between sort of spending quality time and building trust and community with each other and also getting down to business. So, what we'll try to do is do chunks of getting to know each other each time and build on that. So, um, if we were physically in person, we would probably be sitting around a room or in a circle. And so what I'm going to do is to paste into the chat the uh, Nathan's arbitrary virtual circle order, uh, which tonight is going to be reverse alphabetical order by last name. And as soon as I can find chat, that should work. All right, can you guys see that in the chat? Excellent. Um, so what I'd like to do, starting with Tina Muncy, is to ask you each to introduce yourself by name, name your pronouns, and then respond to the prompt, which is toggling between screens here. Uh, tonight's prompt is, please describe a moment when you connected meaningfully to your education. and. For those of us who are not in high school, I mean high school or earlier. So you're going to have to, for some of us, we're going to have to think back kind of far. So again, describe a moment when you connected meaningfully to your education. Uh, and in the uh, get through the agenda culture, culture that we live in, see if you can keep name, pronouns, and the prompts to about a minute. Tina, go ahead. Hi, I'm Tina Muncy. It's she, her. Um, I'm going to say, Nathan, but uh, I'm going to answer this question, but I don't know anything about who these people are or what they're about. Um, what did I uh, connect meaningful to my education? Um, probably, to be honest with you, when I started teaching. Um, it made sense to me what I had learned and clearly made sense what nobody had taught me and I should have learned. And um, one of the things I did was teach for 10 years at Main Street Middle School and checking in with mi middle schoolers certainly taught me a lot about my education, what I should have learned or had learned. How's that? Thank you. Um, when Susie joins us, we'll go to Susie. Sigrid, you're up. Hi, I'm Sigrid Olson. Um, she, her are my pronouns. And um, my freshman year in college, I took a um, geology class that was really, really hard. And I totally hated it and didn't get it. And you had to memorize like 150 rocks, just putting the rocks out on the tables. and. Um, Anyway, I didn't connect with that class then in that class, but years later when I was doing a cross country camping trip and I got to go to all these really cool places out in nature where you could actually see what that professor was actually talking about with how 
with things like glace, glaciation and how rocks form different things. Um, then I connected with it. <laughs> Thank you. Brett? Hi, I'm Rhett Williams, uh, he, him. I connected with my education. I, I'm not sure exactly how this works, but I read a lot of, I, I started reading The Hobbit and I read The Hobbit and White Fang in third grade. And I thought I was really cool because I read these big books that I probably didn't fully understand. And somehow, I think there was something growing there, I guess. But I just thought it was cool. Dorky. Um, so Nick Connor's name is on this list. And that's a, a mistake on my part. Nick has expressed interest in the committee and will be considered by the board at, the, at their next meeting, which is this Wednesday. Um, because I am an N, I will take Nick's place in the order. My name is Nathan Suter. I use he, him pronouns. And um, I'm going to just remind the adults that I'm asking for us to reach back to high school or earlier about when we connected with, with uh, education. And the way I tell this is that I, when I tell people these days about my history with education, I describe my experience of high school as having had three or four really amazing teachers. And um, that, you know, one of them, I remember handing him handing me a, uh, an English paper that I had written. And I, I can't remember if, I think it had something like a C plus on it. And it said C plus and it said gift. Um, so he was one of the first people to truly hold me accountable to being serious intellectually and to um, not just sort of phoning it in. And it was, uh, so I'm, I'm forever grateful to him for not, um, not pretending that I was doing better than I was. Uh, Merrick, you are up. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Merrick Moden, and my pronouns are he, him. And I connected meaningfully to my education actually today when I met with a local uh, state representative on behalf of a CBL program at our school. And if you don't know, a CBL is basically a really great opportunity offered by our high school to uh, like engage and connect with members of the community. And it's really, it's really great. Thank you. Thank you, Kale. Or oh, Merrick, my apologies. Um, Mel, do you go by Mel or Melissa? Yeah, yeah, I go by Mel. But I mean, I'll answer to Melissa, but for um, uh, Mel and I use she, her pronouns. I really struggled. Like I really couldn't think of anything. And then Nathan, when you thought of, when you mentioned your teacher, that reminded me that, yeah, I had those. It was those relationships. Cause it's not really about what you learn. It's about feeling safe and connected with other people. So yeah, I had that. Um, and when I thought about that and that's when I like lit up with dope a sparkle and like woke up. Um, is that I remember the first time in seventh grade literature, like I guess it was like English language something. Um, I don't know what they called it. They had a name. Anyway, um, I, had a, I had a teacher who taught that everything's connected to everything. And that like you could zoom way out and just because people didn't tell you that things were connected, that they were and that they are. And I still do that. I like do that for a living. Um, and it, and I, I would have never kind of picked that up if not for the safety and connection of that relationship. I love the words you were using, safety and connection and relationship. Thank you. Um, Libby. And dopa sparkle. Come on, Nathan. <laughs> you, you already covered that. <laughs> Uh, I'm Libby. I'm the superintendent. Um, I use she/her pronouns. Um, 
Uh, the immediate story that came to mind. So my dad was my was a sixth grade teacher in the elementary school that I went to. And he was everybody's sixth grade teacher and everybody's coach. So everybody kind of referred to him as dad. Um, so I was in a very safe environment around my elementary school because I was there all the time. I would just go to my dad's classroom and all the teachers knew me. And I was actually named Libby after my fourth grade teacher who was, whose name was Libby Vandewalker, who was a good friend of my, my parents. And I had Libby Vandewalker as a fourth grade teacher. Um, and things kind of came pretty easy for me. Mrs. Vandewalker used to give out homework passes um, for, to get, you know, to get out, out of homework for a night. And so I had earned a homework pass and I went to, to give it to her, but it had ripped in half somehow. I can't remember how it ripped in half, but it had ripped in half. And Mrs. Vandewalker, my namesake, would not take it, would not accept it because it was ripped in half. And so she said, if you can figure out a way to give me a full certi the certificate back in full without using tape, then I will accept it. And so that night I thought long and hard about how to, how to, I couldn't use tape or glue and I couldn't, and so it was ripped right in half. And so I went home and I used dental floss to sew the two pieces, the pieces together um, and walked in the next day with my dental floss sewn homework pass to Mrs. Vandewalker feeling very proud of myself. And she just laughed hysterically and she actually kept it for years and gave it back to me when I, high, when I graduated from high school. Excellent. Joe? Good evening, everyone. My name is Joe. I teach at the high school, he, him pronouns. Nice to see familiar faces and to meet some new folks. Uh, for me, it was my high school history and Latin teacher. They just made me feel super empowered and really feel good about learning. And I remember like a specific moment in the spring of my ninth grade year where I was like, I wanna be a teacher and I've never looked back. Excellent. Uh, Emery. Uh, hi, I'm Emery Richardson. I use she, her pronouns. Uh, and I also did a community-based learning sort of uh, thing this past fall where I got to look into medical professions because I'm interested in going into medicine and uh, learn about healthcare policy. And I, I just really appreciated that. And I enjoyed earning credit and learning about something that I'm interested in. Thank you. Um, Elliot? Um, hi, I'm Elliot. I use he, him, or they, them pronouns. Um, the moment or like the time that came to mind was when I was in sixth grade, I took Spanish class for the first time. And like my teacher, I had always like not wanted to raise my hand or talk or anything in class. And she respected that, but she'd be like, hey, I'm going to call on you today. And the way that she slowly like, like made it so I could talk in class was like, like, crazy helpful and now I can do that and it's like thanks to the way that she was able to integrate me into doing that. So. That's fantastic. Dottie? Yes, hi, I'm Dottie Guifre. Uh, I use she, her. And um, the first time that I can remember, I was very early in my life that I, one of my grandfathers worked in a school that was in a small town and was closing. And he was able to get a big slate chalkboard to give to me and one of the old school desks that was bolted to the floor after the school closed. And my cousins and I used to play school from the time I was probably four or five. Um, and uh, so that was one piece of being excited about education. And then um, when I was in seventh grade, I had a remarkable English teacher who focused totally on poetry. And that really rang true for me. And when I got to college, I had two outstanding professors. One was Roland Barth, and some of you may have read some of his work. And he had 
every week of his course, which is two semesters long, um, everyone had to write what he called a two pager, which meant you had to compress everything you needed to say and everything you wanted to say in exactly two pages, double spaced and not one word more. <laughs> So you got to be very good with writing that way. And then when I lived in North Carolina for a couple of years, there was a professor there called Mary Lois Staten. And she was um, sort of the mentor for all the students who wanted to be teachers. And she singled me out and said, how would you like to teach in one of our local rural schools? And we didn't live there long enough for me to do that. However, um, you know, she remained someone who wrote to me and conversed over the years afterwards. And she was what I would call an excellent teacher. And so I've had more than my share of role models. And by meeting all those people, in the end, I started um, an early childhood program of my own and ran it for 18 years and started some programs for other um, individuals and schools for in early childhood. So that's sort of my love right now. And it always has been is working with the youngest children to help them learn how to use their senses and use how to use their language and get along with each other socially. So, you know, I'm really into that. <laughs> Dottie, thank you. And uh, it's no fair giving me goosebumps. I can't believe you got to study under Roland Bart. I did. And it was the best, <laughs> best learning experience of my life. Very cool. Thank you. Carmen, you're up. Hi, um, I'm Carmen. I use she, her pronouns. And uh, I couldn't really decide on one, but I think one recent one was. Uh, Last year during the pandemic, I did a lot of online classes and one of those was through CCV and it was like a comparative religion class. So at the end of the semester, we had to go sit in on three services um, and then like do this whole project that was like kind of connecting that to texts that we had read to then like current events. And I don't know, it was a really interesting and like grounding sort of thing in the pandemic to see this part of the community, I guess I hadn't seen before, which I really liked. So. Thank you. Uh, Caitlin? Uh, my name's Kale. I use he, him pronouns. And I, I have to, it may, maybe well, it wasn't like a learning experience, but it was like a bonding experience that I had in school. But um, our seventh grade, the end of our seventh grade year, we have to something like Crafter's Edge, if you, you may know, in the middle school, um, which is like your own company in a sense. Um, yeah. And I remember all of us, you know, writing our resumes and like talent, like, like doing our interviews to each other to like, you know, practice and something about that just kind of like felt good for a change. Like everyone was like trying to get the same position and, um, you know, it made school feel like real life in a sense. And uh, I think it was a, just one of those things that a lot of kids probably don't have in like other schools that I really like how it was implemented in uh, Emma Smith. Thank you, Kale. And I apologize, I read the wrong name there. Now you're up, Caitlin. Kale, thank you for paying more attention to the alphabet than I was. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. My name is Caitlin. I use she, her. Can you hear me? I never know if these headphones work. Um, so like a lot of you, I, I immediately think of connections that I made in school and teachers that I made those connections with. And um, I thought of a few of them, but my first memory of like school is so fun and I love my teachers so much was um, in second grade. And I remember that we were all being like really loud and rowdy and wouldn't settle down. And my teacher was like this really tall, fun guy. And he, um, like went under his desk and he came back up with those glasses that are like black plastic with the nose and the mustache. And he was like, now kids, let's get cereal. And it was like the funnest, funniest moment 
ever. And I still remember it. Like when I think of elementary school, that's the moment I think of and just how much I loved my teacher. So that's what came to my mind. Thanks, Kaylin. Amira? Hi, I'm Amira, she, her pronouns. Um, there's a few moments, um, but I guess most recently, the best experience I've had was CBL this past fall um, and kind of this year because I kind of have always known what I wanted to do, which is be a nurse, but it really gave me the plan and the stepping stones to how I wanted to become a nurse. And I also created a lot of really good connections with not only like my advisor, but the people around me in my community that led me to get some really great opportunities that I'm really grateful for. Um, other than that, just connections with teachers that made me feel comfortable and safe and allowed to be myself and just knowing that they're there for me to help with whatever I need help with, so yeah. Amira, um, you're gonna be able to get me back on this at some point, but for anybody who's uninitiated, can you unpack what CBL means, please? CBL is, it stands for community-based learning, um, which is basically you pick a topic or whatever, like an area that you're interested in and you wanna explore further. And there's a really endless options that you can do. Um, I personally did informational interviewing and I did over Zoom or Google Meet or whatever it was, but there you can just like meet, you can interview people or you can, uh, some people did like volunteering. Um, some people just did exploring like through their computer or just opportunities um, at like schools or whatever they were interested in. It's really a big wide range of things. Thank you. And the reason I said you might be able to get me back in the future is that um, I guarantee that either I or some professional educator on this call or who knows will use jargon or an acronym. And if any of you are ever stuck, just say, what are you talking about? Um, so I thank you, Amira, for unpacking that. All right, Amelia Woodard, bring us home. I'm Amelia, I use she, her pronouns. And I think one moment where I really connected with my education was in ninth grade during COVID, we were doing this project in our GIP class, our social studies class, where we would have to pick a country and we would kind of track what was going on during that, like in that country during that period of time. And I think that really helped me connect with the world outside of what was happening just in my life was really fun and we would have to do presentations to the class so it also helped me gain a little bit of confidence with that because I remember being really nervous about it at first but then the more we would start to do it the more confident I'd get the more I would just get into the research and like be excited about what I was presenting so that was really fun. Thank you Amelia. Uh, Susie can you hear us over there? So Susie just joined us under the name of Emmanuel, and when Susie comes on, I will see if we can coax her into jump, jumping in. Okay. I'm just going to give it a minute. Hey. <laughs> Susie, can you hear me? You're muted. Okay. Hi. <laughs> yes, I can hear you. Thank you so much for coming. I'm sorry that we uh, stuck with the original, the six o'clock schedule and made you join late, but thank you for joining. I'm sorry to be late, but I'm glad yeah. to be here. This is, we, we all have real life, real lives. Um, <laughs> so Susie, we've just gone around and asked everyone to uh, state their name, uh, share their pronouns, and then share a moment uh, or describe a moment when they connected meaningfully with or when you connected meaningfully with your education. And for those of us who are beyond high school, I'm asking us to reach back to high school or before for that moment. Okay. Um, I'm Susie Ford. 
uh, she, her, she, and a connection with my education. Well, there are some positive, but there are also some negative moments of my education, um, but we'll stick with positive for now. I had a really great, two really great art teachers in high school, and um, I took every art class that was available to take, and that was my happy place. And those two teachers really um, made me want to go to school and made me want to be part of what was going on. And I, that was my area of, um, that's where I excelled in the classes. And I think a lot of it had to do with those two teachers. Excellent, thank you. Okay, so I, um, we are doing perfectly on time so far. We'll see how long that lasts. Uh, next up on the agenda is to, to discuss the visioning project itself, um, touching on purpose, process, and outcomes. And then I added another point for, for questions and discussion. Um, the, I'm going to read, I'm going to open this up by reading aloud from the RFP, which I think I've got over here, uh, just to, so that you all hear what the district wrote as it was seeking to launch this process. In 2018, Montpelier Public Schools and Roxbury Village School combined to form Montpelier Roxbury Public Schools. The board and administration have worked for cohesion through policies and procedures and are now embarking on a process to bring our communities together to discuss and determine what our vision for a high quality education looks like for students. Um, MRPS School Board seeks a consultant to support a broad community engagement process that effectively captures the voices of students and community members often underrepresented. This process will serve to engage the community to gather qualitative data to capture what an exceptional education within MRPS looks like. This includes questions such as how to ensure all students from Roxbury Village School and Union Elementary School Elementary through Montpelier High School have equitable access to resources a diverse and a culturally responsive curriculum with the district maintaining financial sustainability. MRPS board will establish a committee to hold this process led by a facilitator or facilitators. All right, so that's the charge. Uh, I, I'm lucky enough to have been selected by the board to be that facilitator. You all raised your hands and jumped in to become part of this committee and I'm thrilled to have you here. Uh, I'm also quite frankly stunned to have as many of us on the call at once and hope we can continue this record because it's really good to be all in one space together. Um, so that, that's what the, the charge is, is, and I'm going to give a little bit more of a backstory from my perspective and um, Libby, feel free to jump in or, or uh, Tina, especially. Um, Previous to merging with uh, merging Montpelier and Roxbury together, the Montpelier district had <clears throat> within its uh, within its school board a series of ends E N D S uh, that the that the school board and the administration and the schools were seeking to achieve, and so you know that that might have been. Um, I don't remember them specifically, but it might have been 100% graduation rate from high school, or it might have been. Um, you know, uh, foreign language exposure for every student or something like that. So those ends helped shape the board's behavior in terms of decisions that they made and how they prioritized everything from uh, finances to um, the facilities to uh, how to choose a superintendent and then how to direct that superintendent to go about the process of educating students. Since the merger, that hasn't existed in the same way. Um, we have a very capable group of administrators and educators, um, but the school and the school board has been doing lots of other things and building policy, but the school board is looking for and the district is looking for a cohesive vision from the community that will be used to guide the the behavior of the board and decisions the board makes and help people like Libby make decisions about how to go about delivering education and excellence 
and then that trickles down. We can use different different structure of language, but that affects how education happens in every part of the school district from community-based learning that Amira was talking about to all the other experiences that um, that we have in our schools. And I see Libby, Libby listening carefully. Would you, what would you add, Libby or Tina? Just for the overall purpose of this group, from, from my perspective, um, <clears throat> there's a couple of things. When I win the Powerball, I'm gone. I'm, I'm leaving and you need, need to find a new superintendent because I will be living in the Caribbean somewhere or Europe, maybe I haven't decided yet. Um, so um, when that happens, you want to you want to hire a superintendent based on what this district needs, not just based on the candidates who apply. Um, so so the district wants to go out and find a superintendent because there's tons of fantastic superintendents in, in the nation and in the state of Vermont. Um, However, we all do our job very differently. So you want to be thinking about how, you want to be thinking about what do you value from that sense. And then the second thing is, um, is that one of the things that I get told a lot in my position and the board does as well, is that goes with our values or that isn't part of our values. And the values depend on whatever topic that person is trying to persuade myself or the board to agree with. Um, so it could be when, when I, I'll just give a couple of examples. When my first year we were talking about uh, introducing busing to Main Street Middle School, Tina, you'll remember this because you were a board member then. Um, you know, we had some people that say, as a community, we value walking and healthy living. And so therefore we should not have any busing whatsoever. Well, as a community, we value easy access to school. So we should have busing, you know, it, it depended on whichever position. So value becomes um, very charged uh, in our district um, when people want to prove their point. Um, so what one of the things I've said to the board is we've never defined that. <laughs> we've never defined what our values truly are. Um, and so this this committee uh, is to help reach out to community to, to truly define what those are. So when people come to the board or to me or to our principals or anybody and say, well, that's not what we value, um, we can say, well, this is what we value. We, we have this um, document and that could change over time. Um, however, I think having that, oh, that large community conversation is so very important that has never happened when we merged. And I'm not sure if it happened prior to merger either for either Roxbury or Montpelier. Um, so that would be my two cents. Fantastic. So I think it's important to note that our role as this committee, my role as a facilitator and our role as this committee we will certainly have input on those things, especially you all. Hi, Caitlin, I'll, see, I'll get to you in just a second. Um, we will certainly have input on that, or you will. I'm the facilitator, so I'm, my voice is gonna be really just in support of you all. Uh, but our job is to go engage the community, engage uh, you know, the people around us, and listen really carefully to, as Libby said, what are their values? What does excellence in education mean to our community? And that will shape the future of, of education in Montpelier Roxbury um, for years to come, hopefully. Caitlin, go ahead. Um, I don't know if you've already done this, I apologize, but I'm a visual learner and I'm wondering if we can have a copy of the charge. You absolutely can. Um, I have, let me just take that opportunity to say um, two things. First, I love what you just said, Caitlin, about I'm a visual learner. I'm conscious that all of us learn in different ways or learn better in certain ways. And one of the things that I'm doing at this moment is not putting anything written in front of us because the way I behave is that if you put something written in front of me, I immediately start engaging with what's written and I'm trying to stay engaged in this conversation. In support of that, I will follow this meeting with an email with a number of links in it uh, and or actual text that is in support of, or either follows what we've covered or is in support of what, we, what we've covered. Is that helpful? Perfect, thank you. Yep. Um, and then, oh, so the, the 
if at any point any of you is saying, I'm really having trouble following this, could you please, can you post the agenda in the chat? Or um, could you repeat that? Or could you find a different way to present that? Please advocate and be assertive about that. And I will try to be conscious of um, as, as much as possible incorporating different ways of accessing what we're doing in these meetings or in the materials around them. Um, and so I, I was going to say this later, but I'll say it now. Uh, I don't, I'm not all knowing. I'm not perfect. Uh, I'm going to do the best that I can to work with this group in a way that is inclusive of all voices and conscious of the way people engage. If I'm missing something, especially uh, for your own way of learning, you can either approach me individually or just say it out loud in the meeting and I will adapt and, and incorporate. So thank you for that, Caitlin. So vision and values um, and listening in the community. Um, this is about students and it's about students who will become adults. And I was thrilled that we had eight students who were interested and that the board chose to expand the number of seats on the committee so that we have eight seats. We are, tonight we're missing Esterline. So uh, I, I reached out via text, but have not heard back. But those of you who are in school with Esther, if you have their contact and want to send them a, a quick text, that would be super helpful. And I'm hoping that, thank you, Amelia. I'm hoping that we will see Esterline next time. Um, uh, and I'll come back to sort of representation on the committee a little bit later. One of the one of the pieces of this process is, or the, one of the ways that I've approached this is to think about what's our scope of inquiry, right? So uh, Libby told a couple of, of what I think are powerful stories about the way that the community interacts with the dist with the school board or administrators, and why the the district wants to have this tool, this vision and values tool, to apply to its work. So as I was thinking about that, I was thinking about, okay, what's our, what's our scope of inquiry? And in this case, Caitlin and others, I am going to share my screen for a minute. Uh, is that gonna work? I see, uh, Kale, you, you may be on a phone, is that true? Are you gonna be able to read okay on the phone screen? All right, fantastic. Uh, so can you see? Give me a thumbs up if you can see a document in front of you. Yay. All right. Um, so the scope of inquiry, district-wide visioning, the results of this process should see, serve all stakeholders in practice for the board and the administration, the vision, values, priorities, interests, et cetera, I think, should guide the work of each body, that is the board and the administration, serve as a tool for decision-making, offer structure to, dis to discussions about competing interests, budgeting, capital planning, curriculum, et cetera. Uh, and then my question to myself and now to, uh, to this group is, what areas or central questions shall we pursue in this process? Here's an example. It seems evident that when we're talking about education, we'd be talking about academics. What are the outcomes that the community values most highly relative to academics? Is it graduation rate? Is it admissions to college? Is it proficiency at grade level learning standards? Is it workforce preparation, et cetera? So I, um, one of the ways that I think is trying to think about how will this be expressed in you know, our, our final report to the board or how will this be useful to the board and the administration? And within academics, we can have with the, commu with the community as we engage with the community, meaningful, discussions and learning about what the community cares about in terms of academic outcomes. Um, so then I made a draft list of areas of inquiry that I thought were relevant to this process. And I've, uh, the administration has had a little bit of a whack at this. The board has had a little bit of a, uh, a swipe at this as well. Um, this, I don't think, well, we might have, we might have time to discuss this tonight. Um, this is an example where I'm presenting a list that's that's had that's that I drafted that's had some input from other folks, and you're probably seeing it for the first time. 
And I'm conscious that when we do that, expecting you to be able to, to respond to it in a way that's meaningful on short notice is, is a high expectation. So what I, this will be one of the documents or, or uh, one of the lists that I'll share uh, virtually with the group after this meeting. My ask to you all is to uh, look this over and think about both what is there and whether it seems appropriate and appropriately represented and much harder task, think about what's absent. Is there anything absent from this list that you think is important for us to investigate as we engage with our community? So I'm going to stop talking and just leave it for two minutes and let you read and think. So I'm watching body language and it seems like we might be, have had a good enough chance to read through that. Okay, great. I'm gonna stop screen sharing for the moment. And again, I will share that with you all after the meeting. Let me get back to my agenda here. Um, so then even if we refine that list some more, how are we going to go about this? And the process that I've proposed includes drafting a survey that we will distribute to the community and get input that's through the survey. That may include actually calling people on the phone and we fill out the survey as we're having a conversation with them to make sure that we are getting engagement and input from whomever it is. It could be um, you know, a certain age group could be a certain demographic. It could be we're not hearing enough from Roxbury residents. Uh, so we're going to, I want us to be as proactive as we can be to ensure that we get input from as broadly as we can imagine it, what our community is. It's also going to include public gatherings uh, or in, in a format that I'm using from architecture, which is called a charrette. And a charrette is uh, I can tell you the story of that later, but a shred is a public gathering where people are doing active hands-on sort of designing and thinking together in a way that's collaborative and that points towards an outcome. Um, those are my ideas. Those are things I, with which I have experience. And I'm also happy for us to co-design or collaboratively design other ways to engage the community. For example, to engage with students at the high school, we can go into the high school and schedule times during Sol Solon block and invite students to come join with us at, at those moments. We can try to meet in other spaces in the community where, where folks gather. <coughs> so the, this is an example, the, both the scope of inquiry uh, and the public engagement sort of design and follow through are two examples where 
I have some firm ideas. I've done some outlining and I've done some pre-work to set that up. I'm also open to input and adjustment and especially creative ideas about expansive and, and deeper engagement with the public. Another piece of this is that I'm hoping that this committee is going to be involved in participatory engagement, meaning that you all will help make phone calls and will help distribute surveys and will uh, appear at public gatherings and listen to what's being said there and then bring all that back to this committee and to our findings and report it back to the board. But to me, that has a, a secondary and almost equally important effect, which is that you all then become recognized within your community as people who are engaged in this process and that you can become an ambassador and a, and a, uh, a messenger and a communicator between the school board, this committee and the community uh, network to whom you're connected. And in my ideal world, even after this process is concluded, you all have now had that, will have had that engagement with the visioning process with leadership and with your community and that you can persist in um, sort of leadership or service leadership roles within the district. Okay, so that I'm gonna pause talking and open up the floor. Are there questions? Is there, is there discussion? I guess a question I have is um, how detailed do we go? Like once I start thinking about things, I feel like my list is getting very detailed. And um, yeah, I guess that's my question. Caitlin, uh, one of the ways that I asked a similar question of the administration was inevitably, I think in, our, in this process, we're going to hear from folks who are asking about how the district goes about accomplishing these outcomes, as opposed to what the outcomes, what outcomes the district wishes to see. For example, um, Amira mentioned community-based learning. That's a, to me, that's a, a how, right? That's a, a method that the district uses to engage students with real world, real world learning. There's PBL, proficiency-based learning. Um, there's the tech center, there are student teacher ratios, there are questions about which foreign language. And I think both from the charge and for what, from what's reasonable, that's probably not our territory. However, I don't want to deny that those concerns and interests are out there in the community. And so one of the things that I, I'll be working with us on is how do we receive input in those areas in a way that honors that impulse, somebody says, you know, I don't like community-based learning, or I love community-based learning, um, which is a commentary on how the district is delivering on, on these goals. So how do we take that and make sure that we record it and honor that voice, but that we also do a little bit of um, real-time sorting where we say, uh, thank you for that input. Uh, that is a, that's an example of how the district delivers on this vision, um, and then we do a little bit of redirection. So that's, that's one response to my response to your inquiry there. But I think we are going to encounter your question a lot in terms of how much depth do we go into. Uh, I feel like the amount of depth we go into kind of depend on our values as a community. Like, how much detail we want to go into certain topics and certain details depend on what we value most and what is really a good thing for our community and a, have a good outcome for us. I agree. And I think one of the things I like about this committee is that We've got a lot of different folks on it and a lot of different voices represented. And it'll be interesting to see where, you know, as we, as each of you sort of advocates for, hey, I want to pay attention to this. Um, and I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a, a sort of contentious zero sum scenario. I just think it's something to pay attention to. Thank you. 
Uh, I've got Sigrid, then Tina, then Kale. Yeah, I have a question about the, um, the list and the idea of giving people a list. Uh, and I don't know if that is, has already been decided or, or not. Um, part of me is not sure that giving people a list is going to really elicit their um, natural or first responses or responses that really rise to the top for them versus something that, you know, it becomes, you know, so if, if you are in, in a, in a, you know, as genuine a way as you can in different, you know, and that would depend on the different settings, the different groups that you're speaking to, whatever, trying to really, at the very beginning, just elicit sort of from people, what do you, what do you think, you know, what do you, what would your vision be for, for our schools? That is going to, to me, get a much different answers than giving them a list and I know that might be a little too too in the weeds right now but it's I'm, I'm having a little bit of a of a problem understanding the process that we're going to do because of the list <laughs> I love that comment can I can I just hold that and come back to it in a minute after I hear yep. from Tina and Joe yep so my um question is a process question also I've had actually several people since I've mentioned I was on this committee ask me how I ever found out about this committee and how one applied and how were people chosen. And so I know the problem with having 5 million people on a committee. So I just need to know what the answer is to that question. Was this advertised? Um, Merrick, I see you. I see your hand there. Uh, Tina, the so. I posted it on Front Porch Forum. I put it into Friends of Montpelier Schools. I reached out. I, I probably paid, put more energy into recruiting students and uh, reaching out into the Roxbury community because those are those were high priorities than I did to a broader community outreach to recruit members. Um, I think if we had had too few folks interested for community seats, for example. Uh, I think we would have extended that window and reached out even more. And I think that if we have, and, and I guess the other thing, yeah, so I'll, I'll stop there. So am I, well, that tells me you advertise electronically. And um, so the, the next question is, I'm assuming you have all the people you need on the committee at this time in any given group or what is what's my answer to that that's a great question um i would encourage folks who are interested to be in touch with me or be in touch with me and you and i think for me there's a balance between a committee that's too big to be functional but also a committee that's representative and so i think that um I'm feeling, so let me share another comment. I, I, I got another comment about, you know, there don't seem to be enough teacher voices. Teachers are a really critical part of education. Absolutely a true point. Um, and I, one of the ways that I approached this was, this is about a community vision for, and community values for education and so it's a, we are the conduit for that. Uh, and I guess the other piece that I'll say is that even if we stay with this committee as it's formed, our job then is to ensure that the people we connect with are representative of our community. So I'm not, to me, I'm not closing the door on that discussion. I think it's a good question. Are you okay to leave it a little bit in limbo? Yeah, that, that helps me with what the answer is. I mean, I know oftentimes the board forms a committee and says, we like three of these, four of those, five of these kind of thing. And I wasn't sure how that began. 
Um, and then to, to, in the interest of full transparency, in my proposal to the board, I named, I named a proposed shape of the committee. We did a little bit of re, reshaping in the process, but I'm responsible for what you see here. Not that I chose the people on the committee, but it's my design. And so um, criticism, criticism to me, if there's criticism, uh, you can point it at me. Um, I've got Kale, Merrick, and Joe. It, I didn't know if is everything is it my turn to. Yes. Okay. Um, I had two questions. Um, one was like Sigrid's the old idea of, you know, giving a list out. Um, almost. It uh, it forces people into boxes, and not in like the sense of like they're. I feel like, you know, giving it more like, what do you think is like, you know, the biggest priority? Um, it gives more of a uh, flowier answer that's probably more, you know, it's not as rigid, so it's probably more to their own opinion. And then my other question was more of, uh, you know, let's say we, it comes back and it's, it's March and it's our second meeting and we, we've, we've done, you know, something, some way to you know, learn from the community and it comes back with like, uh, we wanna focus on uh, academics and, you know, culture between, you know, kids and outside adults, like, you know, outside the school. Um, would separate groups within this group tackle individual things or would we almost, you know, you know, tackle one thing separately as a whole, you know, cohesive unit? Uh, that's a great question, Kale. Um, I'm going to address that first, and I want to circle back to the one that you and Sigrid have both, both brought up. Um, this committee is not responsible for interpreting or for, um, for thinking about how the district will change its behavior or respond to vision and values, right? So we are we're gathering that information. We, we are responsible for doing so in an organized and uh, I, you know, inclusive, uh, aggressively engaged, you know, aggressive public engagement fashion, and then presenting that to the board uh, so that they can then work with that. This myself as a facilitator and possibly this committee may work with the board in May, June, and July about, okay, what, what next from there? Um, and I guess my other response is, let's let's see what we hear. Um, so I really appreciated both your and Sigrid's comment about, you know, if we give some, if we give folks a list that constrains their thinking, and I completely agree. I th maybe I maybe I should be clear. My approach to the, one of my approaches to this process is to ask myself, okay. What do we want to learn about? What are the big questions facing this district or any other, any other district? And so I tried to name for myself what those buckets are. And I tried to be, I tried to name enough buckets on that list to be inclusive of things that I could imagine people saying. That does not mean that we have to present that list as the, as the only, you know, the only boxes within which people can respond. Um, it does mean if we only hear about academics and we don't hear about, you know, transportation, food service, and athletics, then we need to do some work to hear what people's vision is that includes or that addresses those things. Um, we also have, we don't have to distribute a uniform survey, right? We can distribute one version of the survey that is somewhat structured to one cohort, and then we could ask another cohort to respond to, um, you know, free response questions, and then we can literally code. You know, I saw the, I saw, we saw, twenty-two in, uh, instances of this word being used or this phrase. You know, we can do that work of sort of the work that social scientists do of sorting um, the way people have expressed their vision or their values into useful categories. The risk there is that we. Uh, we, ju we just need to be careful that we are interpreting what's being said 
with as much integrity to its intent as possible, as opposed to filtering it then through our own lens. So I think, I think what Sigrid meant when she said this was, I'm gonna put it in this bucket. Uh, so I think those are great questions. And I think that um, we will, um, I will try to have some more draft work done by the next meeting so that we can both respond to a, a draft survey and also think about how else we might go about this. Is that helpful for the moment on that topic? All right, Joe, and then I see, so let's see, um, sorry, Merrick was after Kale and I skipped, yeah, so Merrick, then Joe, and then Mel. All righty, so this question I think was kind of just answered, but is this committee just meant to define goals of the district or also uh, propose solutions to those goals? Primarily the first. And again, this is the, the weeds here and the, and the weeds are very alluring. The weeds are to start to design how, how the district follows through or delivers on vision and values. And if you wanna see Libby break out in hives, we can go deep into that and start doing the job of Libby and the curriculum director and the education leaders in the schools and the teachers for them. And um, I don't, I'm not an education professional, professional, right? And we could argue that the students on this call are not yet education professionals despite being consumers of education. And so then there's a, I think there's some valuable guardrails in public education in terms of who holds what role. Um, but Merrick, let's, let's, let's acknowledge that that's going to, that question or versions of that are gonna come up a lot. And if, you, if you're okay to hold it in that kind of limbo, that works for me. Right. Joe? Your last few answers, Nathan, got at what I was wondering about, which is just like how, like, are we more revealing if there are competing visions? So I think you've covered it. So thank you. And thanks to the people who asked. So things, I'm going to be excited and things are going to get interesting on this committee if there are competing visions and competing values. And I think some of the interesting work might be this group trying to figure out, okay, we, we initially see these two values as competing, but in fact, is there some Venn diagram where there's, there's meaningful overlap and can we, find, um, can we find the language or can we find, yeah, can we find the language that honors what we're hearing over here and what we're hearing over there? Um, so, it, you know, we'll see. It's gonna be fun. Mel, you're up. You're muted. Thanks. Um, I find myself also wondering if there's the opportunity to zoom out a little bit about, you know, so, so the shared premise of we're gonna to work together to build this survey. And then I find myself wondering, well, there are gonna be some brains that can't access a survey or can't access a survey in certain contexts, or even the language that we use in, in a survey, in a focus group, um, it sort of depends, you know, so if, um, and, 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 you know, as a, as a, as a professional and as a parent, I have like so much that I unlearn on a daily basis that I have to think again about. Um, but I was taught as a doctor that you interview in a particular way. You ask these open-ended questions because that's what you get all the information. This way you're not leading. But guess what? There's some brains who cannot respond to open-ended questions. Their limbic system does not allow them to do it. And so thinking about how do we ask the same question in multiple different ways and give people freedom and choice on how to pick to participate, including, you know, within our district, you know, perhaps we have um, community members, students 
who participate, um, you know, uh, it, you know, by 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 drawing, by building, by you know, uh, gesturing, using AAC devices, just thinking about really being inclusive of that all forms of communication are okay, and that's that's so hard. But Love if that. we don't do it that way, we're gonna leave out leave out some people including that it matters when you ask like for me so i'm a person with auditory processing differences and there's no closed captioning in this meeting i can do the thing but i'm tired and so if you gave me a survey after this meeting i would kind of rush through it i'd check the box i'd be kind of done and i participated but i didn't really um so so like during the school day after the work day what time's the meeting like really kind of matters thank you um this is one of the one of the times that I learned this in my life, or a, a version of this was in um, in intense discussions with my partner, and she and I process at different speeds. We have you know different orientations to such things, and I've learned that if my interest is in a uh, coherent, caring relationship, then you know, I have to do some work to make sure that I'm meeting her halfway. And so that's, that's part of my model to encounter what you just introduced. And I really appreciate it. Um, Mel, the, again, I'm open to lots of ways to go about this process. And I recognize that, you know, an agenda in outline form written on a page displayed on a screen is not everybody's best access point. And so if you will collaborate with me and, and help keep us open and creative about how we go about this. I think that's a terrific idea. Are there other hands on this or can we move on a little bit and, and with the understanding that, that no, no discussion is completely closed? All right, I've got some cameras turned off. I've got a few thumbs up. All right. Um, next up on my so time check is 710 or 711. We've got about 20 minutes left. Um, my neck, I'm just going to read through the agenda as I see that see it next. We've got next steps, and that includes uh, draft calendar, COVID question, future agendas, and how we create those, uh, some housekeeping items, and the next meeting. And then a, an important piece that I want to hold space for every time, which is asking for reflections and closing the meeting. And the reflections piece is, how are we doing as a group in this meeting? Uh, am I talking too much? Are we, you know, I, I didn't hear, um, you know, I didn't hear much from, uh, it's not really true, I didn't hear much from Rhett tonight. You know, so one of the things I'm going to be paying attention to is who's contributing and uh, do I need to hold space for folks, but I want you all as well to be reflecting on how did this meeting go, how's the process going, broadly speaking, and I'm going to make sure that there's space for input on that. Sound okay? Okay. Um, so meeting wise. Uh, so the draft calendar I sent out. The, in one of the emails, and that is, uh, and again, this will be in writing sent to you again after this meeting, so you don't need to take notes if you don't wish to. February 14th, February 28th, so two weeks from today, tonight, uh, the times are going to, we're going to try to be consistent with 6 to 7.30. Um, then March 14th and 28th, April 11 and 25. May 9 and 23, and June 6 and 20th, if necessary. Um, one of the things I like about those dates is that they seem to avoid um, school breaks or other obvious conflicts of schedule. Uh, that's not the only thing to discuss in terms of a uh, draft calendar. As soon as we start getting some more shape to this process, we'll be calendaring public engagement and public gatherings. Not that every single member of this committee is going to attend every public gathering, but that'll become a little bit more complex organic calendar exercise. 
Um, for this meeting and next, we are meeting virtually unless you wish to show up at the high school and I will be here physically present if you want to come. Um, but that's, I think, gathering virtually is the most accessible thing for us to do at the moment. And we are still at a sort of waning Omicron COVID surge. So I'm putting a pin in discussing COVID protocols next meeting. Uh, and I will try to do some thinking and maybe put my head together with anybody else who's interested about how we might sort of set some triggers ahead of time for when we're comfortable meeting in person or if. Uh, future agendas. So as a, as a facilitator, I will prepare a draft agenda in advance based on business in front of us in the stage of the project. That draft is only a draft, and I wish to keep the doors open for your suggestions. Um, my intent is to be organized enough that you have a chance to look at that ahead of time and give me input on other things. Uh, if topics arise during a meeting that we cannot attend to during that meeting, I will also be tracking those and try to place them into future agendas. So that's a, um, if you're a, if you are, if you've, thought about or worked with folks who talk about white supremacy culture. One of the characteristics of white supremacy culture is that we will get through the agenda and we will not bend and we will stay on time and we will not make space for discussions that are not on the agenda. Um, that's, not, uh, that's not my style, but it, um, the temptation to have in-depth discussions about meaningful topics that we didn't anticipate is something that I'm open to. It is in tension with getting through the agenda and keeping this process on track. And so I'm just gonna acknowledge that tension and, and I will name it if there are times when, when I say as a facilitator, I think we should table this and move back to the agenda and keep moving. Um, and of course, that's an opportunity for you to say, listen, white man, um, <laughs> we need to talk about this a little bit more. So hold off. Um, in out of respect for one another uh, and for the limited time that we have together, please come prepared having read material ahead of time so that our discussions are productive. Uh, I will try to keep that sort of concise and organized so that this isn't taking massive amounts of your time outside of the meeting. Um, I'm going to reiterate that your input is valuable. Uh, please email me, text me, or call me if there are topics you wish to see on the agenda or that you want to revisit or talk about. I am I'm here for, for that and we'll try to make space to talk with you. Um, as we potentially have members of the public joining our meetings, uh, I think the opportunity for public comment and participation is important and we'll just sort of monitor that and see where we can make space for that while still getting through our business. That's a lot of talking. Any uh, strong reactions? Okay. Um, housekeeping items. I've created a shared Google Documents folder into which I will put resources for this committee. I need to check with Libby. I'm watching her face right now. This is, we're not the school board, but we are a committee of the board do documents that exist in a shared folder for this committee, are those public documents? Okay. Yeah, and you can't use Google Docs. Oh. You can use Google Docs, but you can't comment on them. Okay, so, so maybe they will be PDFs that are not um, writable, but they're um, static resources and anybody can see them. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you, Libby. And please keep me honest on that stuff. Um, for those of you who are not staff or teachers of the district, uh, you will be earning a stipend for every meeting that you attend, and I will need a W-9 form from you um, that I will send to you in an email attached. It'll also be linked in the email, and it'll be part of that shared folder. And the sooner you get that to me, the sooner I can write you guys checks. Those checks will be coming from uh, BUILD, my consulting practice, not directly from the district. Uh, so if you see an envelope from me, then that's what that's, hopefully that's what that is. On my mind for the next meeting, COVID protocols and if and when we gather, discussing quorums and sub quorums, 
uh, as we make decisions. I see you, Tina, hang on a second. Yep. Um, the subquorums idea, I just wanna speak out loud. For example, we have eight student members of this committee. It feels quite important to me that student voices are represented throughout this process. So we may choose to say, we will only make significant decisions with three or more students present or something like that. So that's what I mean by a sub quorum. Uh, and then quorum is enough people to make a decision. And right now we might go with 50% plus one. We can, we can discuss that next time. Uh, I mentioned a, a survey draft and a, I appreciated the sort of comments about, okay, if we, if we write a survey that's based on this list, are we constraining people's thinking? And then uh, outline with more depth what public gatherings might look like, and then possibly get down to the granular detail of planning some phone parties where we are all sort of virtually together and making phone calls to engage with the public, because I think that's a, an effective way, especially in COVID times. Okay, I'm gonna pause. Uh, Tina, you're up. And then we've got a little bit of, oh, and Kale. And then we've got a little bit of time to reflect on meeting and process. Um, from your discussion about the documents, uh, let Libby uh, tell me if I'm right on this. Since this is a public committee communication to you or to Libby uh, could also be public. And since we're meeting with the public, it's uh, good for people to know that something they write could turn up in the Times Argus. As Libby Rule of thumb, if you don't <laughs> want to be in a, a headliner in the Times Argus, don't write it. Um, and generally, because it is a board committee, what I would recommend is um, if you're writing uh, Nathan and the committee members, like the whole committee, so it would be uh, Nathan is the person you're writing to and then BCC the rest of the committee. Um, and the board just says, dear Nathan, uh, committee BCC'd. And what that means is if somebody replies, then it's not a whole conversation on an email thread that other people don't have access to that you're replying just to Nathan. Um, you could write to Nathan and CC me or CC the board members and then BCC the other people. Um, but it's just kind of the rules of thumb for uh, public records requests and that kind of thing. And just to, thank you for that, Tina and uh, Libby. And just to expand on that, the implication is that we should be making significant decisions in committee in a public forum, not privately via email away from the public eye. And so that, you know, if, if those kind of discussions are happening via email, what I will do is aggregate them, bring them to the committee, and we will have that discussion publicly. Kale, go ahead. Um, what was I gonna say? Oh yes, time frame for everything. So our next meet, I mean, maybe this is what you're getting at in a little bit, but next meeting is the 28th, I think is what I remember looking at. Um, is there a date we are almost setting, like proverbially, like, you know, is it May or March or whatever that we want to, you know, hit as a deadline to have something proposed to the board or, is that kind of still up in the air? Uh, the board would like to have a report of our findings by early May, if possible. That means that March and April are gonna be heavy months for us in terms of public engagement. And we're gonna see how it goes. You know, it could be that we get really tremendous response and we, we you know, it goes really well. It could be that we're, you know, we're, we're trying to squeeze, um, blood from a stone and we've got to work really hard. So we'll see how it goes. But but March and April, I think, are the months where we will be doing heavy public engagement. Good question. Thank you. Go ahead, Mel. Um, and and I, I, this is not intended to go deep. I'm just throwing it out here because I will forget. Um, I, I found that the many of the themes from the initial offerings about relationships and connection and safety were really meaningful. And that stuff starts in our earliest learners. And I wonder if we can also build into our agenda next time about how do we include 
the values of those learners. I know it might sound ridiculous that like a preschooler could have values that weigh on the system, but guess what they can. Um, and when I ask young kids about like, what is it, you know, what makes you feel safe? What makes you feel like you belong? They literally had answers. They literally have things to say. Like I asked an eight year old the other day and the eight year old without any latency at all was like, you just let the people do what makes them happy. What? Yeah. You just let the people do what makes them happy. And you, oh, and then he's like, and you don't take away their freedom and choice. Genius. So like, that's a kid who's not on this committee because he's too young to be on a committee. So like, how do we, how do we get that wisdom and capture that? Because there's a lot of really incredible young brains out there. I will confess to mostly recruiting in the high school and the middle school, but there are no hard age limits on this committee. We'd have to think about like maybe some other opportunities for participation besides coming to a 90 minute meeting. For sure. Thank you. Sigrid? Yeah, oh, I'm sorry. curious. Oh. Out. Yes, Sigrid, go ahead. Okay. Um, I'm curious about the, the time frame. Um, and, and if that's a typical time frame for community wide processes like these, it seems a little short to me. And um, the, the, the worry with that is looking like it was rushed or, or having people left out just because of the time frame. In that time frame, we also have, you know, April break and um, so I'm just, you know, I don't know, is there leeway with that or is, is that a short time period for something like this? I don't really know. It just seems, seems short to me. Uh, I think it is short and I don't know, Rhett, is, is your comment addressing this or something else? Not that it is short, okay. there's no question. And Sigrid, there may be leeway uh, that, you know, we have a, there's an open discussion. I think we can have an open discussion with the board. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the board asked for time to work with our findings with support from me. And that is also valuable to, for them to, to commit time to this. So it's, it's intention, but also valuable. In yeah, another case. thing to think about is that's just when stuff is warming up. And then, you know, if you think about what gatherings of humans look like in Vermont, um, it, and if there is in fact, you know, going to gatherings to interact and talk with people that, you know, it's not really gonna happen too much. Um, May is better. May, yeah, May especially is better during COVID much. in the summer if people are, yeah. I hear you. Brett? Um, I just, I know I th from my perspective, I think most likely from the board as well, the, the work of this committee is to reach out to as many groups of people that are otherwise difficult to engage or to hear from. Uh, including, I really appreciate, Mel, you mentioning sort of, sort of thinking about the way that we approach people with neurodiverse circumstances or language diverse circumstances. I mean, there are a lot of people who communicate in a lot of different ways. I know I've been on the board a very short time. I've seen you a couple times, Tina. So there are certainly some people that have no problem sort of stepping forward and making their voices heard. I think our work is to, is to, is to find everyone else um, if we can, um, as much as we possibly can. Um, and I like, you know, I, I think it's really important to think of, to approach people in as broad as way as we can. But I do wonder how we then start to filter some of that information and what that process looks like, essentially, how we sort of dilute what we're getting. And I'm also curious about, I know the thought exchange was out there. And it did a lot of, it gathered a lot of data. And I don't know if that information 
can get folded in. Well, also I wanna recognize that the people that responded to those tools are a very sport, sort of specific group. And that might inform us to try to get some of that information to other people that didn't respond to those thought exchange. I don't know if those are a resource for us or if there's any way that any of that work can inform the way we approach the community from here on out. Just to Kale, okay, I see you there, and um, Rhett, I appreciate all those things that you just said. And uh, there's been work that points to vision and values by the School Safety Committee, by the Thought Exchange. So there, there are other, there have been other inputs, and part of my job is to is to try to bring those in. And I think that your your central question is sort of how do we? I think you meant distill. How do we distill the the different inputs and maybe even sort of weight them, right? Or, 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 okay, we've heard a lot from this group. What about from this group? Uh, and I think that that's part of our part of our job as a committee. Kale, and then we've got one minute to go. Uh, final thing was I heard something called a thought exchange. Was that like a survey sent? I is that a what? I guess what is that? Was it a? Yeah. So Kale, do you remember, um, we've sent out a couple of thought exchange to students. One was about the next MHS principal. What would be your hopes for that? Oh yeah. And then another yeah, was, one around yeah. the grant money that we sent to the MHS. So it's just a different, it's like Google, it's like Google surveys on, on steroids a little bit. Like it's a, it's a little better access than Google surveys because everybody can see what other people are saying. We haven't sent out, uh, right, I wasn't sure what you're referring to, because we haven't sent out a thought exchange on this particular topic just yet. We've sent out a bunch to the community, but not particularly to this one. Uh, but it's certainly a tool that we can use. I was just thinking that there are themes that are weighted in there, and I wonder if that can inform the way that we ask questions. Yeah, absolutely. Good. Uh, it's 7.30. I've, I've lost my window for reflection on our process. Mel, I saw your text comment uh, in the in the um, chat. Folks, thank you for coming tonight. I will be sending you a follow-up email with information in it. Please feel free to reach out, um, especially individually, and note, again, this, these are public meetings. Uh, they're being recorded by Orca Media. Uh, they may be covered by the press, and documents that we share are also publicly accessible. So um, that's, to me, that's a great thing, but it's also something to be mindful of. Thank you all very much. Happy Valentine's Day, if you care about such things. And I look forward to seeing you on the 28th. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Bye.